A grim milestone in a decades-long dispute. Nuclear neighbors, India and Pakistan, have contested territory for 70 years. Is there any peace on the horizon? I'm Imran Garta, and today's newsmaker is the conflict in Kashmir. This week, the conflict in Kashmir turns 70, and there's very little to celebrate. As one of the world's longest-running territorial disputes, it's killed thousands of people, and countless more are missing. And renewed violence in the past year has ended hopes, an end could be just around the corner. So why so much unrest? Both Pakistan and India claim the disputed territory as theirs, and they haven't shied away from fighting for it. But with both nations now armed with nuclear weapons, a new full-blown war could be more disastrous than ever. Many people in Kashmir say they just want to be given the right to self-determination. Would that bring a resolution? Or is the region destined for more violence? Randolph Nogle takes a look. Seventy years since it began, the conflict over Kashmir remains the main bone of contention between India and Pakistan. The Muslim-majority state of Jammu and Kashmir is located on the northwestern tip of the Indian subcontinent. At the time of partition in 1947, it was expected the Muslim-majority state would choose to join Pakistan. However, its Hindu ruler, Maharaja Hari Singh, elected to stay independent. But after hundreds of Pashtun fighters invaded from Pakistan, Hari Singh invited India to take control. War broke out and the territory was divided between the two after the UN brokered a ceasefire. India and Pakistan fought two other wars over Kashmir, one in 1965, another in 1999. Unrest has grown since the early 90s, after a homegrown popular separatist movement emerged in the Indian-administered part of the region. New Delhi blames Pakistan-based militant groups, such as Hezbollah Mujahideen and Lakshari Taiba. Pakistan denies any involvement. It says India is using the militant activity to cover up its own brutal crackdown. We're urging both the state government and the central government first to immediately stop the use of pellet firing shotguns to police demonstrations. We're also urging authorities to initiate prompt, independent and impartial civilian investigations into all incidents where the use of these shotguns led to deaths or serious injuries. It's been described as a tactic as opposed to a consequence. In a report titled Losing Sight, Amnesty International said Indian soldiers have used pump-action shotguns to disfigure and maim protesters. It's only fueled more protests and violence. The Indian authorities have responded by extending their crackdown, including a curfew in certain districts. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his right-wing BJP have shown support for the crackdown. The fervor of the BJP is matched by that of militants turned political groups in Pakistan. Kashmir's borders remain as unclear as the future of the conflict itself. The question that still looms over the most prominent scar of partition is how will one of the world's oldest conflicts be resolved? Through dialogue or another war between two nuclear armed powers? Randolph Nogle, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Indian-administered Kashmir, we have Mirwais Muhammad Omar Farooq in Srinagar. He's the chairman of Kashmir's pro-independence all parties Hurriyat conference. Thanks so much for joining us, Mirwais. 70 years on, let me ask you very directly, who is to blame for the current situation in Kashmir? Well, um, it's the uh, absolute intransigence of the government of India, which is to be blamed for what is happening in Kashmir because they are not ready to accept that Kashmir is a political problem. It's a political dispute. It's not a territorial issue. It's not an uh, issue of uh, uh, good or bad administration. It's not a land dispute. It is about the aspirations of the people of uh, Jammu and Kashmir who are under the worst kind of military occupation for the last 70 years. And I think unless and until the government of India understands the fact that uh, the, the issue of Kashmir can only be resolved uh, when the people of Jammu and Kashmir will be given their birthright, the right to self-determination, only then 
we can say that things could, could possibly move forward. You want that referendum, which was earmarked in UN Security Council Resolution 47. Is that what you want? Yes, I mean, that is uh, the basis of the Kashmir dispute, that the world community, especially the United Nations, has made a commitment to the people of Jammu and Kashmir that uh, their will and aspirations will be, uh, you know, uh, taken into consideration and the final settlement of Kashmir issue uh, would be, would be uh, you know, made available. So the Huriyat Conference has, for the past many years, I mean, in fact, uh, we have suggested to the governments of both India and Pakistan that either you abide by the UN resolutions, call for a referendum and give the people the right uh, in both sides of the Kashmir, which is obviously one part is with India, the other part is with Pakistan, or uh, what we call an alternate negotiated settlement can be uh, when India, Pakistan and the people of Kashmir sit on a table and there could be talks in terms of what the future dispensation of the uh, issue of uh, uh, Jammu and Kashmir can be. But when the Indian government turns to you and says, OK, Mirwais, that sounds good, and that UN Security Council resolution is a fact of life, but what's also a fact of life is that India has gone to war with Pakistan. In 1972, there was an agreement, the Shimla Agreement. This will be resolved bilaterally, and there won't be that referendum. We will solve this between ourselves, between India and Pakistan. They see it as something that supersedes any need for a referendum. How do you respond to that? See, I mean, uh, Kashmir is an issue about the people. It's not an issue, it's not, Kashmiris are not dumb, driven cattle that India and Pakistan will decide on their own and they will sit and then announce a, a resolution on the on, 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 a, on a radio or, an, or through a TV, uh, you know, uh, broadcast. You have to involve the people of Kashmir. I mean, the, it's it's about the aspirations, it's about the will, it's about the future of, uh, of, of, of more than, uh, you know, 1. Uh, 14 million, 15 million people who are living a life of misery for the last uh, 70 years. And I think, uh, uh, you know, if India and Pakistan could have bilaterally resolved the problem, they would have by now. I mean, the fact that, right, you talked about Shimla. I mean, after that, we had Agra, we had Tashkent, we had Lahore. We had so many bilateral agreements between the two uh, countries, but all of them failed because Kashmiris were never a part of any, uh, any, uh, you know, any uh, uh, effort. So it's important that if India and Pakistan are going to move forward, they will have to involve the people of Kashmir on both sides of the ceasefire line. Would you like to join Pakistan or have your own independent country? Well, that's what the people have to decide. I mean, we are saying that let this put be to vote, that do the people of Jammu and Kashmir want to stay with India? Do they want to go with Pakistan or they do want an independent state? So the question here is the, the will and the choice of the people to decide. Neither India nor the government of Pakistan will decide. It's the people of Kashmir who will decide what their future and what their uh, you know destiny should be. And, and you've mentioned, you know, the lockdowns, the curfews, there's metal pellets blinding teenagers, kids being used as human shields. It got very ugly last year specifically, about six years before that as well. Ter terrible unrest on, on the streets. But as things stand, it seems as if even though it's bad, ultimately it's still a tolerable agitation for the Indian government. How do you feel about that? The fact that they feel that they can still manage this? Well, you're right. You're absolutely right about it, that unfortunately, the Indian approach has been always to manage the conflict. And, you know, uh, they have the they have the resources, they have the money and uh, and, and to top it all, they have the military might. I mean, more than 700,000 troops of India are uh, monitoring Jammu and Kashmir. Kashmir is the world's highest military size zone. And you rightly said about about the fact that they are dealing with this problem with an iron fist. I mean, uh, what happened to the teenagers, what happened to the students, more than, you know, 3,000 cases of pallet injuries, more than 11,000 people being arrested last year, the entire leadership being caged, put in jails, put in house arrest. I mean, what better can I explain the situation uh, rather than the fact that, you know, when I'm speaking to you right now, I am under house arrest for the last one week. There have been no Friday prayers allowed in the main mosque of Kashmir, which is the Grand Mosque, the Jamia Masjid, for the last three weeks. There has been curfew uh, every Friday so that people won't assemble in the mosque, and which could lead to an anti-India uh, uh, rally. So this is how they're dealing with the situation. So in a situation like this, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I must say that uh, what also is dis what we are being, we are dismayed by the fact 
that there's lack of international attention towards Kashmir. I mean, you know, every time we hear the Americans or the EU or the uh, OIC saying that India, Pakistan have to uh, solve the problem, uh, they are not in, in a position to solve the problem. That is why we feel that there has to be international mediation, assistance, whatever name you give it, there has to be a third party intervention. Mm -hmm. You mentioned lack of international attention. Something that gives a lot of international sympathy to the Indian government's point of view is when Lashkari Toiba or Hezbollah Mujahideen kill people in your name, in the name of Kashmir, in the name of liberating Kashmir. How do you solve that mess? Well, I think, you know, as far as militancy is concerned, yes, militancy is there. Nobody can deny it. But militancy is not the, uh, not the whole struggle. I mean, yes, there are some boys, and we are even, we are even uh, concerned about the fact that some well-educated boys, some educated youth are taking up to arms, which is we feel that, you know, we don't want that to happen. We don't want them to get consumed in the conflict. But the fact is that they are being pushed to the wall. I mean, if you look at last year's agitation when this young boy, Burhan was killed. I mean, he was literally forced to take up the arms. He was so much he was so much tormented by the police, by the security agencies that you know he he he, he decided to pick up a gun. Uh, you know, uh, because his family was targeted, his 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 you know other friends were targeted. So this is a story of every Kashmiri. Nobody wants to take a, a, a you know an armed uh, resistance. We know that Kashmir cannot be resolved through any military might. It cannot be resolved through force. But who is pushing the young boys of Kashmir? towards force i mean who is who is who is who is P p pushing them uh, to pick up stones. I mean, you are not allowing discussions in universities. You are not allowing, uh, you know, any student activities, any student activism. There is ban on any student activism in Jammu and Kashmir. The Hurriyat Conference, which is the main pro, pro freedom alliance of the parties in Jammu and Kashmir, has not been allowed to hold a rally, a sit in, a public protest. So there is uh, there is ban on everything. And you know, when you talk about the Indian state, they have the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. They have the Black Law which give them impunity. You cannot charge any police officer or army officer, even if he kills people at his will, because they are protected by special laws. So in a situation like this, when the, the world community talks about India being a democracy, well, uh, ask Kashmiris who are seeing the real face of Indian democracy for the last, um, you know, uh, 30 years, uh, in, in general, and 70 years, you know, as far as the conflict is concerned. Are you honestly telling me I mean, under, it's understandable that the situation is really awful for a lot of people, particularly in places in the valley when it's under lockdown and so on. But are you honestly telling me that someone like Wani had no other option in life other than to pick up a weapon? See, if you look at the, if you look at these boys, I mean, that is not, uh, not what I'm saying. Even the press and the media have, have reported their stories that these boys, these young boys, some of them have been engineers, some of them have left their uh, jobs, some of them uh, have been doing good in college universities. So, you know, they have been pushed literally to the wall because there is no scope. I mean, people, there is a section of people who feel that there is no scope to pursue a, 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 a non-violent struggle because that's what people did. You talked about 2010, 2008, 2016. It was all peaceful. I mean, you know, uh, so who is using violence? It is the state which is using violence as a means to, to uh, subjugate an entire population to, uh, you know, to, to uh, suppress uh, the aspirations of the people of Kashmir to brute force. And this has to end, yes. We as a political group, we as an organization have so many times said that we want to engage with India, with Pakistan. We want to find a solution to the Kashmir problem. But to that, the government of India says that, you know, we are having, having elections in Kashmir, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the assembly or for the Indian parliament, which can never be a substitute. Even the UN resolutions are very clear when they say that no internal election in Kashmir, whether for the parliament or for the day-to-day uh, -day administrative affairs, can be a substitute uh, for the plebiscite. So what the people of Kashmir are saying that either you do a referendum, you call for a referendum, what, how the, uh, the how the Brexit thing was was done, how you know there was a referendum in in in, in Quebec, in other parts of you know uh, uh, of the world, or you have a, a dialogue uh, process where India, Pakistan, and Kashmiris sit across a table and they uh, resolve try to resolve the problem. And and to be clear, when you say referendum, you mean a referendum in the valley, which would then also include, I guess, the pandits in, in Jammu, include Buddhists in Ladakh, include 
Pakistan administered Kashmir as well. Do you want to include all of it? Well, of course, if you go by the UN resolutions, the entire state of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, as it existed on 14th of August 1947, is a dispute. And if you look at the, uh, the, the you know, the, t the layout of the state right now, I mean, there are three, uh, three regions, Jammu, Kashmir and Ladakh, are under Indian control. And, and Azad Kashmir and, and uh, the northern areas are under Pakistani control. So these five regions constitute the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, and that is what the UN has said, that there has to be a referendum in the entire state of Jammu and Kashmir to assess the will of the people. My, my final question for you, from the outside looking in, um, a lot of international eyes see Kashmir through a stability or security prism, and their existential fears are related to the fact that both India and Pakistan have nuclear weapons, and I guess you can also include the Chinese. They have nuclear weapons, and they also claim a small part of Kashmir. And so a lot of the fears are that some of these sporadic clashes between Indians and, and, and Pakistanis might escalate into an all-out nuclear war over Kashmir. How much does, does that factor into the thinking of people who live in Baramula or Srinagar, just ordinary Kashmiris? Well, it is a very difficult situation for especially those people who are living uh, near the ceasefire line. I mean, uh, you know, in the past one week, more than 10 people have died uh, in cross LOC firing. And uh, we, we saw how close India and Pakistan came to uh, each other in the Kargil war. Uh, and, the, you know, uh, we saw an all out war in that region. So, yes, you know, as you rightly said that India, Pakistan are both nuclear uh, neighbors and uh, uh, China is also a, a nuclear neighbor. So in that context, there is all possibility that if uh, the world community does not uh, come in and push India and Pakistan uh, towards a negotiating table and, uh, you know, involve the people of Kashmir. I mean, see, we as Kashmiris have always welcomed, we want cordial and better relations between India and Pakistan. We want these countries to come together because we know that unless and until India and Pakistan come together and come closer to each other, there can be no uh, resolution of the conflict. But the fact is that for the past three years, the approach which has been adopted by the Indian government, especially uh, led by the Hindutva, uh, I mean, the, the pro-Hindu BJP, they have toughened their stand on, on Kashmir. They have hardened their stand on Pakistan. They are not talking to the Pakistanis. They are not talking to the Kashmiris. And they are looking at Kashmir primarily from a security prism, primarily from a law and order problem, where they are trying to give an impression to the Indian people that everything which is happening in Kashmir is Pakistan-oriented, is Pakistan-sponsored. And just to say that, the fact that, you know, that uh, in, in, in the last one year, 2016, 2017, more than 170 people have died in Kashmir. And our uh, question to the Indians is how many Pakistanis are there? Not a single, uh, you know, uh, uh, Pakistani for that matter. So this discourse or this uh, confusion which they are trying to create is basically to ward off the pressure that whatever there might be, that, you know, that this is a not an indigenous struggle, it's a sponsored struggle, while the fact is that this is an indigenous Kashmiri struggle aimed at uh, the resolution and the set and the self-determination of the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Mirwais Omar Farooq, I really thank you for taking the time to talk to us on the Newsmakers. Thanks so much. I wish you all the best. Well, we wanted to get the perspective from India, and we had a former Indian Army general lined up, but unfortunately he was unable to join us at the last minute. But let's get the view from Pakistan-administered Kashmir now from Muzaffarabad. We're joined by President Sardar Masood Khan. He's the leader of Azad, Jammu and Kashmir. Thank you very much for joining us on the Newsmakers. Uh, 70 years on, Kashmir is still unresolved. The Indians primarily blame Pakistan. Tell me why you disagree. Well, <clears throat> first I would like to say the 70 years have passed. Pakistan is independent. Pakistan won freedom. India won freedom. Kashmiris have been waiting for the past 70 years. Uh, to win freedom, to be a free people. Uh, they want to determine their uh, destiny. They want to uh, realize their right to self-determination. You say that Indians blame pa Pakistan. What has Pakistan done? Pakistan asked for a peaceful solution of the Jammu and Kashmir dispute. We think that the UN Security Council resolutions on Jammu and Kashmir should be implemented. There should be dialogue. There are three parties in the dialogue, which is Pakistan, India, and Kashmir, Kashmiris. They should have a dialogue, and they should resolve this issue peacefully. India, on the other hand, 
has been killing and maiming and torturing Muslims for the past 70 years. And today, as we speak, as I talk to you, uh, Indian coercion continues unabated. So India, on the one hand, is killing Kashmiris, is committing uh, crimes against humanity in the occupied territory, and uh, it blocks diplomacy and dialogue. So they have absolutely no right mm -hmm. to criticize Pakistan or the people of Jammu and Kashmir. If we had to go by the letter of the law or the letter of the resolution when we come to the UN Security Council resolution, don't the Indians have a point in saying that, well, then you'd have to evacuate Muzaffarabad, where you are now, and go all the way back to the beginning before that plebiscite actually happens? Because that was also in the wording, wasn't it? Yes. Partially, but this is a falsehood. Uh, this is a fabricated argument. In fact, if you have to go back to uh, UN Security Council resolutions, I would refer to Resolution 98, which says that India and Pakistan simultaneously have to evac evacuate their troops. They have to do so proportionately. In fact, if you uh, go back to Resolution 98, India was to maintain only 12,000 to 1,800 troops in the Indian occupied territory, but they have 700,000 troops deployed there. Pakistan was also to reduce the number of troops on its side or in Azad Kashmir. So, yes, Pakistan has always been ready and Muzaffarabad has always been ready that there should be a simultaneous withdrawal of troops or reduction of the number of troops so mm -hmm. that you could pave the way for um, the plebiscite. Yes. We were speaking to the All Parties Hurriyat Conference, with the chairman of the All Parties Hurriyat Conference from Srinagar earlier on, and he said, you know, too many people see this as a bilateral thing between India and Pakistan. We just want to decide our own destiny. I wonder, sir, do you fully accept that and believe that, that this isn't between the Prime Ministers Abbasi and Modi sitting down and thrashing out a deal. This is about a group of people who live in that contested region deciding their own future. Would you accept that? Well, I'll endorse his view. I think it's not a bilateral issue. It is a trilateral issue to start with between Pakistan, India and the people of Jammu and Kashmir. There is a fourth party also, and therefore I would say that it's a quadrilateral issue. The fourth party, the United Nations, uh, which in fact mediated and deliberated and then held several sessions in the Security Council and came up with dozens of resolutions, and they guaranteed that a plebiscite would be held. So, but uh, what Mirwai Sahab said, I would say that it is true that the Kashmiris are the key constituent. They have to decide uh, about their future, about their political future. So I think that I agree with him, but uh, that said, India and Pakistan too are parties to the dispute. That uh, can also not be den denied. Sir, very finally, is there anything to be optimistic about 70 years on? The two countries are not talking over Kashmir. There's border skirmishes along the line of control, violence on the streets like we haven't seen in many years. Uh, for many years, we saw that last year, almost 90 were killed after Burwan, uh, Burhan Wani was killed. Things look bad in Kashmir. Is there anything to be optimistic about? Well, Kashmiris are determined that they would win their freedom. And they think that uh, they have the right to secure their right to self-determination. All I can say is that uh, India's obduracy makes the whole scenario very pessimistic. And uh, uh, you want to look at the brighter side in fact, I see lots of darkness because the international community also is not paying attention to this issue. Uh, they are bogged down by other issues and uh, because of India's diplomatic maneuvers or its strategic alliances or its offer of lucrative contracts uh, or commercial or economic contracts, uh, the world has chosen to look the other way. Uh, what they are doing is that they are appeasing India. Appeasement was dangerous last century. It is dangerous this century because what India is doing every day is that it is targeting innocent, unarmed Kashmiris, killing them, 
and committing uh, 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 crimes against humanity in Jammu and Kashmir. So I'm, I, in fact, uh, uh, the Kashmiris do not know what to do. Uh, the United Nations Security Council itself is silent. It uh, tries to artificially balance the dynamics of India and Pakistan. What we want that uh, the United Nations should come forward and try to resolve this issue. The United Nations Secretary General, the United Nations Security Council, they should demonstrate leadership. Uh, they have their own resolutions. These resolutions are still operative. They need to be implemented. And we think that if they fulfill their role, if they perform their duties, then, of course, there would be uh, some light at the end of the tunnel. The president of Pakistan administered Kashmir, Sardar Masood Khan. I thank you very much for joining us on The Newsmakers. Still ahead on The Newsmakers, the UK sees a surge in hate crimes. But what's responsible for the rise? And a new law looks set to tackle sexual harassment in France. Could Paris introduce fines for catcalling? Welcome back to the Newsmakers. What do terror attacks and Brexit have in common? Well, according to a new report from the UK Home Office, they both could be contributing to a historic rise in hate crimes. The last year saw the biggest increase since records began, with offences spiking after the vote to leave the EU and each successive terror attack. But some say there hasn't been a surge at all. It's just more people now willing to come forward. Yvette McCullough has more. In the wake of Brexit... Oh, my God! ..and recent terror attacks, the UK has seen a rise in the number of reported crimes motivated by hate. Figures from the Home Office show there were more than 80,000 hate crimes reported between April 2016 and March 2017. That's an increase of nearly 30% on the previous 12 months, and the largest year-to-year -year increase since records began five years ago. Nearly 80% of the reported hate crimes were based on race, 11% were based on sexual orientation, and 7% were based on religion. The Home Office says there was a spike in hate crimes following the UK's referendum to leave the European Union, with many of the crimes directed at the UK's Polish community. I lived here for over 30 years and I have never encountered any racism. Uh, this is quite shocking. There's concern that as the deadline for Brexit gets closer, these hate crimes will intensify. Hate crimes also increased following a series of terror attacks in the UK in the last year. Muslims were increasingly targeted in the period just after the attacks in Westminster, London Bridge and Manchester. Sadly, we've seen an increase in reports of hate crime uh, from 28 on Monday, which is our normal average for a day, through to 56 uh, on Wednesday. Whilst we can't directly link these to the events of Monday night, we're continuing to monitor the situation and support our communities. While these figures paint a picture of the UK as a hotbed of growing hate and intolerance, that may not be the case. The data may instead be a sign of a greater public awareness of what a hate crime is. Almost any verbal or physical assault can be categorised as such if the victim interprets it that way. There have also been improvements in how law enforcement records and deals with allegations of hate crimes. And as they are seen to be taken more seriously, people are more comfortable speaking out because they feel they will be listened to. My message to anyone who's the victim of hate crime is please report it to the police. Don't think it's too trivial. Don't think the police will take action. They will. Is the UK's increase in reported hate crime a manifestation of rising anti-immigrant and Islamophobic sentiment, or is it a sign of a greater intolerance of hate-filled crimes? Yvette McCullough, The Newsmakers. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined from London by Lee Jasper. He advised the former London Mayor, Ken Livingstone, on race and equality. Also in London is Andrew Gilligan. He's a senior correspondent 
for the Sunday Times. Gentlemen, I thank you very much for joining us on the Newsmakers. Lee Jasper, let me begin with you, sir. Why so much hate in the UK? Well, I think certainly we can point to uh, the Brexit referendum decision, the recent terrorist attacks, all uh, adding to uh, and raising the profile of uh, race hate attacks here in the United Kingdom. But it's very clearly there's an underlying trend of increased vandalism. There are uh, race attacks a bit like the uh, incidents of rape and the reporting of rape is vastly under-recorded. So the vast majority of race hate crimes have traditionally not been reported. So if the figures are increasing, I think that what that reveals is an underlying trend uh, of increased uh, racial vitriol. Uh, and thankfully, most of this is vandalism, uh, uh, transit racism, uh, people being uh, abused on buses or trains, uh, attacks on uh, places of worship, whether that's Jewish cemeteries or whether it's Muslim mosques. Uh, uh, but it, undoubtedly, when you talk to Asian, uh, black and Polish communities, what you hear is that people are experiencing a greater level of uh, random, stranger, uh, uh, racist, religious abuse than had previously been mm -hmm. the case prior to the Brexit referendum. So I think the government figures are revealing. I don't think it's an issue of increased confidence in the police because black and particularly Muslim communities' confidence levels in the Metropolitan <clears throat> Police Service, as recorded by the Metropolitan Police in their uh, confidence uh, uh, interval surveys, is the lowest it's ever been uh, since... Uh, uh, well, since uh, Met Police uh, record, recorded these things. Right. So, so it, it can't okay. be increased confidence. OK. OK. Andrew Gilligan, let's bring you in here. So is that a, a sound, plausible theory that there's been this underlying hate I on, on, you know, there's the race hate and so on, and Brexit opened the floodgates, perhaps? I, I think some of the increase is definitely real. Um, and there were some very Brexits unleash some very nasty sentiments in, in some of the public. Um, but uh, I also think it's partly due, as your reporter said, to people's increased willingness to report it. And it's also partly due, I think we need to remember, to the internet. Um, a very large number of these hate crimes are online abuse. Um, and what we know is that in all forms of life, in all forms of discourse, people are much more uninhibited, they're much nastier, they're much... Um, they're much less restrained on the internet, on social media, than they are in real life. And I think, if you, I, I think the, the arrival of social media, Facebook, Twitter, the rest of it, has driven down the level of discourse, has increased mm -hmm. people's willingness to, to say hateful things, which, which wouldn't have gone recorded before and wouldn't be capable of investigation. So don't underestimate the enormous contribution the internet has made to the spread of hate-filled sentiments. And of course, the other thing about the internet, Twitter, is it's often anonymous. Right. Um, so that, that's a key factor in, 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 the, in the rise of hate crime. Uh, and reporting is a key factor, but I also do think there's been a real rise, and, uh, and it's disturbing. OK, so let me ask you, Lee, do we have a problem then with the parameters as well, who gets to decide it, and the subjectivity of it all? So, for example, on Twitter, I've been called all sorts of terrible names on Twitter. I usually laugh about it and respond to the troll. For somebody else, they are deeply offended by it and it hurts them and they might report it as a hate crime. So should we be factoring in those digital elements and parameters as well that it becomes quite subjective? One person's hate crime is just somebody else's noisy internet troll. Well, for a long time in British uh, uh, policing history and the history of the courts, there was this uh, subjectivity uh, uh, around the definition of hate crime. And we've had lots of debate uh, following the uh, tragic murder of Stephen uh, Lawrence in the early 90s and the subsequent inquiry to define that. I think that uh, uh, certainly there are individuals like you and I on Twitter who bat away uh, 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 abusive trolls uh, uh, without uh, a consequence of it. But I know somebody else who, uh, uh, who did exactly the same thing uh, and found Britain first, a, a, a quite violent uh, quasi-fascist organisation, turning up on their doorstep. 
so I think that uh, it's uh, one rule can't be applied to absolutely everything. And of course, each complaint has to be taken within its own context. An individual that has been subjected to, to horrible intimidation and racist attacks may well have a lower tolerance level uh, than you and I. Mm -hmm. But can I address the point about uh, internet raising the incidence of reporting? Certainly. Because I think the uh, social media is actually reflecting uh, the level of racism that has always been out there. Even uh, uh, throughout the years that I've been campaigning on this issue, Home Office research studies always talk about the vast reservoir of unreported crimes that take place uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and I think that uh, internet is really uh, reflecting what uh, black and Muslim ethnic minorities in the United Kingdom, particularly the visible ones, have been experiencing for 20 or 30 years. It has now become much more visible because of the internet. But it is not as a consequence of the internet. That's reflecting uh, what was a, a, a consistent reservoir of xenophobia and racism in the United Kingdom that has uh, persistently affected the lives of minorities uh, uh, over the last uh, mm -hmm. 20 or 30 years. So, Andrew Gilligan, has this Home Office report just that, that, exposed yeah. the U UK as being a racist, bigoted society? Well, it depends on how you measure it. I mean, by most measures, things like the proportion of mixed marriages, um, the level of serious racial violence, um, the UK's pretty unracist by comparison with a lot of societies. We, we don't have um, any of the overtly racist parties, some of which are actually now in government that continental European countries have. We have, uh, we have black and, uh, uh, and Asian MPs elected for almost all white constituencies without suffering any kind of um, drop in their vote. Uh, we, the, the kind of campaigns you see in, on the continent of Europe for banning the niqab and banning um, minarets at mosques and things have absolutely no traction here. So, you know, we, we, um, we, by, by those sort of standards, I think we're a significantly less racist society um, than, than many others. But um, that doesn't mean we should be complacent. Mo mm -hmm. Most of the hate crime reported is at the very low end of the scale. Um, there are, there have been a few very serious racist incidents and a few, there's been one attack. Um, there was an attack of terrorism, of course, against the Finsbury Park Mosque a few months ago um, and there's been a couple of other uh, 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 incidents where people have been killed because of their race but they are very very few the vast majority of these hate crimes are, are often quite quite small and, and in some cases I think there are a few you look you dig down into the statistics and I found for instance that uh, several hundred bicycle thefts have been reported as a hate crime now it's quite hard to see how the theft of a bicycle could be a hate crime but the uh, the, Lee talked about the subjectivity of it, and it is subjective, because as, as your reporter said, um, a, a hate crime is defined as any, cr uh, any crime which is perceived by the victim as a hate crime. So if the mm -hmm. victim says, my bicycle's been stolen and that's a hate crime, then it has to be recorded as a hate crime, even though most people wouldn't really see the theft of a bicycle as a hate crime. Lee, is a stolen bicycle a hate crime? Well, it depends if you're uh, the subject of a volley of uh, religious or racist abuse uh, <laughs> during the commission of that theft. You may well, well be. That, that's a separate offence, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, as a consequence, that, that's, that's racial abuse. That's well, a different it's a separate, thing. It's a separate. Nobody would. Nobody just see that was a, uh, but, it's but, still, but just it, you know, having your bike nicked from well, the street is not a hate crime, is it? But but some people are reported well, I mean, in such, but, and they're allowed to, and you know, um, because it's uh, they, no, you know, I hate don't crime think is anything that the victim My understanding of is. Well, My understanding is quite simply this. That's the definition, but the prosecution, which goes through the Crown Prosecution Service filter, weeds out and delineates uh, 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 claims that have no foundation. Yeah, sure, we're not talking about the prosecutions, though, are, are we? We're talking about reports well, of offences yeah, here. Well, we're talking about reports of offences, but prosecutions... I mean, these, these figures aren't for uh, prosecutions, they are reported offences, uh, and so clearly well, yeah, yeah, they do include a number yeah, of offences which people need to be able to find a hate crime, even though you <laughs> might to be not be strictly <laughs> seen as such. OK, finish up, Lee. Well, yeah, what I'm saying is that uh, it depends what happens in the commission of, of those crimes. Uh, certainly, if it's a, a simple bike theft, but that forms a pattern of behaviour uh, that followed your door being, uh, 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 you know, smeared with uh, dog feces, or your children being abused on their way to school, or whatever, then it might seem, on its own, like nothing to do with hate crime. But in the context of a series of incidents, it might well form part of a 
targeted intimidation, targeted victimization. So one can't simply just dismiss uh, the reporting of these hate crimes in isolation as having n apparently, uh, superficially, having nothing to do with okay. hate crime without understanding the context okay. in which those crimes have taken place. Let me ask you, Andrew, the Assistant Chief Constable Mark Hamilton, the National Police Chief's uh, Council lead for hate crime said quote I will be working alongside the government to strengthen our nationally coordinated response to hate crime so he said this in, in response to the report I wonder what what can they actually do to strengthen their approach to this without kind of policing everybody and making sure that nobody says anything out of turn tell me I, I don't know is the answer I think the um, I, I think sometimes this isn't, I'm sure this isn't the case in the vast majority of reports. The vast majority of reports, I'm sure, are sincere and, and, and you know, whether they're hate crime or not, the, pe the person concerned feels that they are hate crime. But I have to say that in some cases, um, extremist groups um, use allegations of Islamophobia particularly to try and intimidate and, uh, and smear those who criticise them. And, uh, and I would be worried if um, the police... I mean, there, there was a famous incident where... Uh, um, a, a, a kind of um, a sort of rent a quote Islamist who got on the radio a lot um, called Mo Ansar tried to report um, the host of a radio program for racism for asking him awkward questions um, and it's that kind of um, nonsense that I, I'd be a bit worried if the police was uh, mm. were, 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 were to start investigating every allegation of of racism and Islamophobia put about by kind of highly politically motivated people. Right. But that I stress is a minority. Right, so, so Lee, does making it easier to report hate crimes, again, going to the text of the law when it comes to that which you perceive to be a hate crime? So Mo Ansar feels that what might be legitimate criticism against him uh, might be a hate crime. Do you believe that it's an incorrect um, allocation of police resources to go and investigate Mo Ansar's uh, point of view now because he feels somebody hurt his feelings. Well, I don't know the details of Mo Ansar's case. He may well feel justified. I know him, uh, uh, and I can't think he would make anything other than a justified complaint. But putting that aside, because those are, as Andrew has already conceded, the uh, uh, extremes in relation to uh, uh, race hate, I think that the law can only do so much in any event. I think that what you need to take into account is that when politicians uh, make the sort of commentary that demonizes communities, uh, uh, that ramps up uh, 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 concerns around immigration, immigration benefit cheats, uh, mad mullers, uh, black criminality, and so on and so forth, what, what they're doing is giving license to a, uh, a, a, a a, a strong cultural trait within British culture, which is both xenophobic, uh, racist, uh, usually sexist and sometimes anti-Semitic. Uh, and it's that kind of irresponsible talk uh, by our leading politicians and sections of the media, certainly not all the media, but there are some sections who uh, forever bang the drum about how terrible migrants are, how terrible multiculturalisms are, uh, how terrible having Muslims in the country is, uh, and how innately criminal uh, black youth are. These are the kind of national commentaries that provide the context okay. for increased racism so, so, and racism. So and loose that, talk by politicians and the media okay. literally cost people's lives. Okay, so Andrew, very finally, how do we put that genie back in the bottle? Don't you have to kind of reform the whole society to do that? I'd be very surprised if, if any of the media have ever claimed that black people are innately criminal outside the kind of national front news or something. That's just not been said. Um, or that migrants are all wicked and wrong. I mean, it's not racist to oppose greater immigration, as, as has been said. Um, and I don't think anyone has said that migrants are are all criminals or, or, or evil. So I think Lee's uh, exaggerating. The, the Daily Mail has come um, pretty I, close. I think some the questions, some Mail difficult questions have to be Sun discussed here. Have certainly become some difficult. difficult and well, LBC is no, another, another victim. Some, no, some difficult questions. So there are, uh, there are examples. Lee, some difficult questions have to be discussed about, 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 um, about bigoted and uh, patriarchal, racist and, and uh, uh, exclusionist attitudes in parts of some communities and, and to do so is not racist and equally some difficult issues such as child sex grooming in northern towns um, have, has to be discussed and hasn't been discussed. Paedophilia amongst the white community, Jimmy Savile et al.
Sure, and that's... And, and I think that, this is the particularism that bedevils this debate. And, and I think that there is a... No, no, there is, no. There is, there is those, a, there are is those are not the vast majority of cases. middle ground. I, 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 don't think that the, I, I don't think that the majority of the media... Uh, I think the majority of the media discusses race in a, in a pretty responsible way. And I think we need... We, we, we mustn't be afraid to discuss issues that need discussing mm. okay. for fear of being accused of racism. And, and I'm glad we've had this discussion on this program. Lee, Lee, I've got I've to wrap you because I have to move on. So I, I sincerely apologize. But Lee Jasper and Andrew Gilligan, I've enjoyed that. Thank you very much for joining us on the Newsmakers. What started things was the Weinstein affair, then there are also smaller affairs, other accusations, and then you have the hashtags and a massive liberation of the speech of women and our society is listening and is outraged. You've probably seen the hashtag MeToo sweep social media over the last few weeks. It's become a rallying cry to protest sexual harassment against women. In France, social media feeds have been flooded by balance ton pork, which translates as expose your pig. And this campaign could have inspired new legislation. France's gender equality minister, Marlene Schiappa, has put forward a bill that would give men fines for catcalling, harassing, and following women down the street. Well, to discuss this and its ramifications, I'm joined from Cannes in northern France by Isabel Attal. She's a women's rights activist and a former member of parliament with the Green Party. Thank you very much for joining us, Ms. Attal. Fines for catcalling. Tell me why this is a good idea. I think it's uh, the meaning with the hashtag balance ton pas. Uh, it's because enough is enough. And um, I'm not sure, in the opposite, I'm not sure that the Minister Marlene Schiappa is doing right with her project to uh, write a new law about harassment because she just talking about um, harassment in street, in the street, mm -hmm. in cities. And we are talking about harassment by politician, by your boss, by a journalist, and it's not exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I, I'm, I'm looking... I don't at, know if, yeah. if you understand. Certainly, but. certainly. I'm looking at French law, and sexual harassment is already punishable by up to two years in prison and a yes. 30,000 euro fine... Um, so I guess it's all up to the definition. Wouldn't catcalling just be included in that? If you can prove that somebody sexually harassed you on the street, wouldn't the existing laws already cover that? I think it's very difficult to um, just to prove that someone harassed you in the street. And it's difficult everywhere, but I don't really understand how you're going to prove anything when it's something's going to happen to you on streets, mm -hmm. because uh, even the minister said that she will not put a policeman, a police officer, in the back of every woman, and um, everything is on the um, uh, the way to take the complaint of the woman. Mm -hmm. If if a woman um, is harassed or aggressed in the street or anywhere else, they need to go to the police office and to have someone understand what they are saying, and take their complaint. Mm -hmm. The problem in France right now is that when you are going into a police office, you are not sure that they will believe you or if they, were, they, they will just say, but lady, it's just a seduction. Why, are you, uh, why do you want to complain? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is a society problem we have. Yeah. How do you feel about the fact that this started with the Harvey Weinstein scandal and then the Me Too hashtag and then this hashtag now in France, uh, Balance Tom Pork, and, and now that's leading to possible legislation if passed in France. How do you feel about how that has evolved from something that started in America but influenced French women enough to say enough is enough? Yeah, I've, I must say that it's not started in USA. I mean, even if the Harvey Weinstein scandal is happening now and that it's opening the door to other uh, um, women to denounce what happened to them before. We started a few years ago. And when you look at the um, uh, social network, you will see other hashtags like Peta Truel uh, in the archaeologist um, uh, work or Peta Rob 
in the lawmaker, and you will have, for many months ago, a lot of uh, women just uh, writing on the social network, on Twitter or Facebook, um, explaining what happened to them without naming, without um, uh, saying which men they are talking about, but they are speaking out. And um, probably with the Arve Weinstein um, affair, I think it's something that's taking another dimension. Mm -hmm. But already in France, for many, um, I can say for many years ago, we start slowly and slowly to speak out. I was interested to read what French actress Catherine Deneuve told a magazine recently. She called the campaign disgusting. She asked, does it contribute anything? Will it solve the problem? Well, I'm presuming uh, she's not too happy with it, but I can't really understand why. Why do you think Catherine Deneuve is, is not happy with the campaign and calls it disgusting? Um, I think many people, and not only Catherine Deneuve, was thinking that um, it's it just a problem to uh, denounce uh, men or point at some of them precisely. But I think it's a mistake. Um, the majority of the uh, testimony on uh, Twitter or Facebook with the hashtag Balance Ton Port or Me Too, women are not telling exactly who is it. Mm -hmm. They just have to um, explain what happened, just to inform other women, um, to try to get other women victims of, of the same um, r men, aggressor, uh, to be able to speak out together. And maybe she's not very um, pleased with this because she's afraid it's taking more uh, power or um, maybe she could have told something if she have noticed, it's like Quentin Tarantino who said that uh, he, he's making excuse because he's, he probably had to tell to the mm -hmm. world or to journalists or to, to police that he, he knew what's happening in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And probably Catherine Deneuve is in the same case. She probably knew something and uh, uh, not taking, she probably haven't taken it too seriously or mm -hmm. Um, think that it's normal in the movie uh, industry. I'm, I'm not thinking it's normal anywhere. Right. Isabel Attal, it's been a pleasure having you on the Newsmakers. Thank you very much for joining us.少子高齢化、緊迫する北朝鮮情勢、まさに国難とも呼ぶべき事態に対して、総理大臣としてこの国の舵取りを担う重責を全うしてまいります。That's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. You can check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Do remember to like, follow and subscribe. Next time, the Philippines declares Marawi liberated. We ask if martial law should be lifted on Mindanao. Until then, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.